The seventh key question we ask ourselves when doing educational analysis has to do with the assessment of knowledge. Now, this follows very logically on from the previous three questions we'd asked. Once you've selected something, once you've sequenced it, and once you've pasted it, well, it's very important to actually check that it's been learnt. And the reason why that's important is not only because of the fact that you want it to be learnt as an end product, but you also have to check how well it's being learnt so that you can correct the problems that were missed and improve on the actual teaching and learning which has happened before. So effectively what happens in terms of that is you have what's known as a feedback loop. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the feedback loop before we get into the dynamics of the actual boundary strength. What you can see in the diagram is a situation where you have a certain input and for our purposes let's just say that that's the syllabus, the curriculum, and what happens is that then goes through what we would call the teaching and learning black box where it all goes down and all the teaching and learning happens and then after that you have a certain output. You have the desired end product that you actually want as a result of teaching and learning. Now it is vital that you have some space within that system to actually test and check that you've got the output that you wanted from the input that you've given through the system that it's gone through. And if you have a situation where the output doesn't quite get to the point where you wanted it to be, well then you have to have a feedback loop. And by the feedback loop we mean that you identify what it was that was done incorrectly and you then make sure that you improve it the next time around that you do it. So the second time you put an input in, that time you improve the way that it's done. And then again, when the output comes along, you test it to check that it's got the desired result. And this results uh, in a, a spiral of improvement where you are continually ensuring uh, that better and better work gets done. And you can see how vital this is for learners and for teachers. Uh, that's why you have a test. It's not only to check that the learners have got the final end product, it's to check what they haven't got so that you can make sure that you actually get that to them either in the next lesson and more importantly than that to make sure that the next time you do the same thing with your next year student set that you do it better. Now in terms of a solid uh, assessment boundary, what you would have is you would have a very clear understanding about what the end result would that is that's needed, the X. And you'd have a test which directly tested for that X. And if that X was not there properly, the feedback would be specifically directed at making sure that the X comes out as the desired result. And that gives you a solid boundary. When you're working with an open boundary in terms of assessment, what you have is you have a situation where there are a number of ways that you can actually do the lesson. There's a number of ways that you can actually evaluate and check the lesson and that gives you a far more dynamic process in terms of what the kind of test is going to be that checks for the uh, result. It becomes a very open-ended process where you flexibly work with where the learners are and where the situation and where the dynamic is in terms of your feedback mechanisms and in terms of your assessment process. Now, the story about feedback is actually vital to the whole way that education functions. And this has been well articulated by a number of people. And the person that I'd like to use just to kind of point to the importance of feedback within the system loop. It's the thing which actually enables the system to continuously improve on itself. And the person who's pointed to that is John Hattie. Now, John Hattie has provided us with a, an interesting um, kind of study. He basically kind of in by 1999, and that's a long time ago, he had done, he, him and his students, had done 180,000 reviews of the uh, most scientific studies on education about improving learning. So really, in effect, he was working with around 50 million learners, which is the total population of South Africa. 
Now, with that amount of um, information, he was able to come up with some key variables that actually improve uh, learning. And you can see that by the effect size uh, on the right hand side of the screen. And what you can see there is, is that certain um, variables have very powerful effects around uh, one and other effects have less um, effect. Now I don't want to spend time on the effect size, I just want to point out that around about uh, 0.40 is the average impact of your average intervention. It normally does good, but it'll do good until the point of about 0.41 or 0 0.40. Anything above that is above the average in terms of improving learning. Now interestingly what he found was that feedback was the strongest and most powerful indicator of improving performance. And it's actually no surprise why. Because with feedback, what are you doing? You're checking that what you have taught, the student actually understands, working out what the student doesn't understand, what he does understand, and then working out ways to make sure that uh, the um, work is corrected and understood in a better way. You work out what the next move is based on the previous move. So it's a very powerful mechanism in terms of uh, teaching and learning. But notice as you run down the list that you get to something like direct instruction. Now direct instruction works with feedback all the time. In fact it continually asks quick questions to the learners and expects them to respond in a way where the teacher can see if they understand or not. And it does that around about 10 times a minute. Strong feedback. Run further down the list Remediation feedback, where you try and correct things which students are doing wrong. Very high on the list. Keep on going down. Mastery learning, where you expect the students to understand at least 90% of the content material. And in order to do that, you have to continually check what they don't know and correct it. So what you begin to see is that feedback exists as one of the key mechanisms to actually improve education uh, in the world. Now that being so, it's quite important to discriminate between the different types of feedback. And this was done by Hattie and Timperley. Uh, and what I'd like to point to firstly is the fact that it was cues that gave the most important uh, indicator of teaching, improving teaching and learning. Now a cue is a situation where in process, you find out that you're doing something right or wrong and it immediately gives you an indication about which way to go. So it happens to the task in the process. Uh, feedback, uh, in terms of the way that Hattie's working with it, is a situation in a classroom where the teacher gives a direct response to something which has gone uh, either wrong or right and shows the student the next step forward. Uh, as you run down through the list, what you'll notice very interestingly is, is that when you get near the bottom, all of a sudden you get to punishment and praise. And interestingly, it is praise that has one of the lowest impacts in terms of improving uh, teaching and learning. What you're doing with praise is you're identifying the individual and you're praising the individual in terms of who they are. You're not actually focusing on the task. Now, in order to make this clear, Take a look at the um, take a look at the matrix which I've put together, which tries to work with four different variables. On the one side with feedback, you can focus on the individual, or you could focus on the task. You could focus on the task as an object in terms of the fact that it's actually been done. There it is as an object. Uh, which you evaluate in its full completion, or you could be involved in giving feedback to the process of actually getting the task done. Now what I would like to do is I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the dynamics of these four. Let me start off with a situation where you focus in on the individual as the object, and it turns out that this is a really bad thing to do. Um, I think it was Alfie Kahn wrote a book called Punished by Rewards and what he was trying to describe was a situation in which when you praise your learner for being a good person 
or being wonderful, well done, you're so good, those kinds of uh, praise terms, what you're doing is you're actually disenabling their uh, future um, performance in education, as horrifying as that sounds. And he points out that what you're actually doing is by praising the individual, you're making them dependent on your praise. And they stop looking to the task itself for the reward. They stop becoming intrinsically interested in the task. That isn't what holds it for them. What holds it for them is the fact that you're going to give them a well done or a star at the end of it. And that is what motivates them. And that is a very dangerous situation because on top of that, you're not getting them into trying to take a look at what they're doing in the process itself. You're getting them to focus just on the reward they're going to get at the end in terms of themselves. And because they feel actually that they are so good and wonderful at the end of doing it, they actually become scared to actually the next time around take a risk because they're scared that they'll be stupid. They'll show themselves up to not be the wonderful person you've actually described them to be. If instead you offer critical advice about the task itself, then they become more prepared to take risks because they're not scared of showing themselves up. So it's very important that you move into a situation where you work with feedback in terms of the other three quadrants of the matrix. In terms of individual process, what you do is you make sure that the individual starts to concentrate on how and why he or she is doing what she's doing so that she can self-regulate. Make sure that she gets this um, understanding of the process at this point, knows why she's doing this at that point, and starts to pay attention to how she is actually learning herself. It's a vital uh, uh, task, uh, it's a vital skill to learn. Secondly, you can focus on the object as a, uh, the task as an object. And what you're doing over here is you're giving feedback about the completed task itself. And you're being clear about why the task was done in a useful or in a poor way and getting the student to understand what your reasons for that are so that in the future they can do it differently. But actually, really the most important of the four quadrants is working with the task in process. And what you're doing over there is you're making sure that at the moment of the task being done, you pay attention to where the student is and what the student is doing, and you give feedback in the process itself. So the student understands why she is doing something right or wrong and what she can do about it to move on to the next level. So that really gives us a, a very brief uh, run through of how to do educational analysis when working with assessment. Firstly, look at the boundary strength. Ask yourself whether it is solid, in which case only one uh, form of assessment is looked for, or is uh, more open, in which case you have a variety of assessment forms which are looked for in a flexible and open way depending on the situation at hand. Uh, secondly, Understand that feedback really is a vital mechanism in terms of the whole way that education works and therefore it's important for education analysis to understand that. And to do that, firstly, break up uh, feedback into whether it works with the individual or whether it works with the task. And secondly, take a look at whether it works with the object or with the process.